Hello, and welcome to episode 19 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. In today's episode, we actually have something a little different for you, which is exciting, and we're going to go into and start our muscle group series. So in this series, we will take a deep dive on specific muscles each episode. You'll learn the function of a specific muscle, common training mistakes, misconceptions about that muscle group, go-to exercises, and why we program the, them for clients, and some key execution cues to nail your technique, and even we'll go into some application on why these muscle groups are a, more applicable, maybe for, for certain divisions when you get into the competing world and, and stuff like that. So the first thing that we're going to go over here is going to be the function of that muscle. Okay. And so today's episode is all about the lats. I guess I didn't say that. So we're talking about the lats. Okay. The latissimus dorsi, if you want to be technical, but I think that's an obnoxious name. So we're, we're just going to go <laughs> with the lats. So the lats are a fan shaped muscle, a lot like the chest, right? So if you can imagine, it's hard to kind of imagine the, the lats as a whole because right, they're not mere muscles. We can't quite see them. Um, if you've ever taken a photo, kind of like a you know, uh, what's that called? What double uh, back, double south, by? Yeah. yeah, back double by in the mirror or back. something. <laughs> yeah, in the mirror or something. You kind of, I'm, I'm out of the bodybuilding train of thought here, but you can you can sort of see those those lats in the lower part of your back. Um, so they're a fan shaped muscle, a lot like your chest. And what a fan shaped muscle means is it has one origin site, right? So the lats originate and the chest actually the pecs originate on the upper arm the upper humerus and so from that origination point they span across like the chest the pec spans across the chest and has multiple uh, attachment points the lat does the same thing along the spine okay and comes down through the fascia on the lower back right? The connective tissue on that lower back. Okay. So it spans across the back, that lower back region and has that one origin site, multiple attachment points. Okay. So what this means and why I'm explaining this is the fact that it's fan shaped means we, it's heavily influenced on body position and where those arms are relative during the exercise, right? Relative to that load during the exercise. So how are we pulling? How are we using those, those arms? What attachment are we using? How are we setting ourselves up? And we're going to talk a lot about this during this episode. Okay. So that's, that's a big part of this. The function of the muscle, the main function is just to pull that upper arm, a pull on that humerus. Okay. The muscle pulls on the humerus and allows us to either pull down in vertical movements or pull back in horizontal movements. Okay. So again, through this, we're going to get a lot of different functions. Okay. We're going to train it from a lot of different angles. We're going to train it vertically. We're going to train it horizontally. All right. And that's why you're going to see a lot of different stuff. You're going to see it on our YouTube channels. You're going to see it on our Instagrams, things like that. You're going to see us use a lot of different movements to train the lats because there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, but there's some key ways to do it. Okay. And then we're going to get into that. But next I'm kind of, I'm going to hand it off here to Sue and we're going to talk more about the common training mistakes that are made within the lats uh, and get into that. Yeah. So with this, a, a big part and what Austin said is that it does attach the humerus. So it does attach the upper arm. I would say the number one mistake I and Austin and Alex and many other people, including clients that I see videos for, the number one mistake they make is not actually pulling with their lats um, because it's something because it's not a muscle that you can see. It's harder to have that mind muscle connection and it ends up being something that you can supplement with really easy. I've seen people trained for years and never know how to contract a lot. Um, and by someone, I mean myself, <laughs> I trained for a good chunk of time before actually learning how to contract my lats. And with that, one thing I want to 
say before I get into that mistake a little bit more is it does take time. So even if you get the execution down and you have a coach to make sure that's set, it might still take time to fully make sure that you're getting that lat. I remember the first time I truly contracted my lat, I was like, oh my gosh, that was it. But it wasn't perfect the rest of the time. It took practice to get there. But that common mistake is pulling with biceps, rear delts, Terry's major. Um, and it's, it's something where people get really well-developed upper back when they think they're training lats. And it's an important distinction to make. And the next episode we do, will probably be going over upper back and all of the musculature in there. But when we're looking at lats with it attaching on that humerus, you need to be able to depress the humerus first. So the humerus should depress before the elbow flexion or sh shoulder extension or anything like that. So if you're thinking about a lat pull down and you have your hands up and on the bar, and I'll talk about grip positioning here in a second. If your first thought is to pull instead of to bring your upper arm down, that is shortchanging your lat training. And we don't want to do that because we want good lats. We, we want that in place and we want to be able to see that musculature. Also with, with her speaking on that, it's not a step one and then step two of pulling where you see this rigid, like depression and then like hold, okay, now I'm depressed and now I pull, it is going to be a continuous motion of, of depression and pulling. So it's, it's, it, it is a, a trained aspect to where you're going to potentially, as you get uh, into the beginning stages of, of understanding how this all functions, it's going to look a little bit more rigid, but you want to work away from that. It, the more, the more rigid that you stay within the pulling motion, the more, um, likely you are to see harm and, 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 you know, injury and, and, malfunction, if you will, mm -hmm. um, within the, the shoulder joint as a whole, if you, you know, stay in this very like locking down the scapula, um, position. Yeah. And the integration is important too. I just wanted to mention that really quick too. And just to expand on both of your points, the integration of those movements is big, right? So the, the depression, so just the driving down is kind of what we mean by depression. So the driving down of that upper arm, um, or the driving back, uh, of that upper arm, relative if you're doing vertical movements it's more of a drive down if you're doing horizontal base movements like a row it's more of a driving a kind of a driving down and back but it's an integration with elbow flexion so allowing those arms to bend those elbows to bend while we're doing that it's just important why we say the first thing to be that depression or the driving down is to kind of initiate with it but past that initiation point it's very important that we're integrated from there with that elbow flexion with that shoulder extension as we drive back or down so just to expand on that but yes so you can continue here but it's it's that very important that it's integrated yeah. So if you think that you're like, I'm training lats a lot and I don't feel like I'm seeing it, but you start to see like, oh, I haven't done that much rear delt volume, but my rear delts are off the wall. It could be a problem within your lat training and your distinction between your lats and your upper back that is causing that instead of necessarily it being that you grow rear delts really easily. It's probably getting more volume than you intend it to be because you're not truly hitting your lat in that regard. Um, so so it's really just thinking about pulling that humerus and allowing the scapula to follow. And like Alex said, not letting it be robotic, but allowing it to follow that movement. Um, so another mistake that commonly happens is losing tension halfway through the movement. And so the shoulder girdle should be the first to move concentrically and the last to move eccentrically. Um, so it's something that as you are moving that shoulder through space, when we're talking about concentric versus eccentric, um, when we're looking at a movement, there's the four parts to a movement, the concentric, um, then there's going to be like the lengthened, then there's going to be the eccentric and shortened. And so as you're moving through it, um, if you're talking about a lat pull down, for example, to make it easy to just give one example, as I am pulling the weight down, that is going to be the concentric of the movement. As I am moving my arms up back towards the starting position, that's going to be the eccentric of the movement. Um, so your shoulder girdle, like I said, should be the first to move concentrically and the last to move eccentrically. Um, and then another mistake that often happens comes to grip. So Alex, do you want to talk a little bit more about the grip and what that looks like for training lats? Sure. Um, so within grip uh, alignment, uh, within lat training is going to be very specific to the individual. So um, for, for some of our smaller athletes who are 
you know, five to a uh, hundred pounds or 110 pounds, their, their, their shoulder width is going to be, uh, a little bit more narrow. Thus they can use smaller attachments, but for the majority of individuals, we are wanting to have an, an alignment that is going to be, if we're training lats in the vertical or horizontal plane, that's going to be a round shoulder width apart or potentially a little bit wider or a little bit more narrow. You could be in that kind of window of things, but um, that would be the positioning more so that we would be looking for. Mm -hmm. And with that grip, uh, oftentimes, especially when you look at something like the lat pull down, you have that straight bar that's up on top. And so it's very easy to have that either pronated or supinated get grip when we more so want a more neutral grip when it comes to lat movements. Um, because with it attaching to the upper arm, if you think about your hand pronated, you can't, you can bring your arm down in that position, but if it's at that neutral positioning, you can bring it through and still keep that lat engaged as much, as much as possible. And, and with that, you, you can like in the initial sense of, um, like performing a movement where you're trying to kind of jam your elbows into this position and, and your hand is in a pronated or, or fully supinated position, it's not going to be that bad in the instantaneous moment potentially, but over time developing tendonitis and things like that or in the, in the elbow or at the wrist joint are things that we're trying to avoid. And, um, a lot of the things that we're going to talk on are, are going to be yes for you to put on muscle at a, at a exponentially better rate and, um, performing the exercises better, but also we're talking to, uh, keep your longevity of training as long as it possibly can be um, w within your time uh, resistance training too. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing here is that scapular position and stability are going to be essential. So I've talked about the shoulder girdle a little bit here, um, but it's also something that because the lats wrap around the rib cage, the arm path and range of motion can be individualized. So like Alex was saying, you can go a little bit wider, a little bit narrow or shoulder width apart. That's going to be extremely individualized just depending on the structure of your actual physique. We said a lot there, Austin, you have anything to add? Oh, no, you're good. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I, I think so when we talk about it, just to, to kind of like back up there, when we talk about pronated and supinated, if those who are listening aren't aren't familiar with those orientations of the the wrist or hand, um, basically a pronated grip is like palms facing the floor, right? Supinated. And I know Alex loves this example. It's like you're holding a bowl of soup. <laughs> Love that yeah. example. Yeah. Um, it's like you're I've holding up. So palms one. facing up. You've never heard me say that? No. That's the only way I remember it. <laughs> he says it all the time. Yeah. I, re I, I remember because I was watching a detective show and they were like, he was laying in a supine position and they were like, what does that mean? And they were like, how do you not know what supine is? And I was like, I don't know what supine is. And then it was like, oh, they're laying uh, on their back and then prone on their front. <laughs> Yeah, so body position a lot as well. Like prone is lying on your on your belly, essentially on your stomach, uh, you know, face toward the ground, uh, like on a prone dumbbell lateral raise or something on a bench, right? And more of a supine position is like you you'd sit down or lay down for a bench press or something, or lie flat on the floor if you were dead, for example. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I just wanted to digress and kind of go over that really quick. Um, but as Sue said, very, very individualized in terms of arm path and, and range of motion within these movements. Um, and Every again, Tuesday. If, uh, yeah. can you, can you hear uh, the mowing in the background or no? No, no, I can't. Okay, sweet. <laughs> yeah, I can't. <laughs> I can't at all. Um, but within that as well, like within those individualized range of motion and um, the, the movement pattern in general, it's very important that we are choosing a proper width for our um, exercise, our attachment selection and stuff like that. The larger you are as an individual, the, the wider shoulder base you have, the, the more you need to adjust your uh, attachment and grip choice. And I know it's not always an option, right? It's not always something where you have access to the equipment we do or, or the prime attachments and stuff like that. Right. So Alex, you want to kind of go over how you'd customize or individualize that to, to someone. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, if you find yourself in a position where your gym is just not, um, 
having the, this plethora of attachments, things like that, moving to a single arm option is probably going to be your your best bet to train the way that we are advising. It's going to lengthen the, the training sessions a little bit and can be a little bit um, annoying, if you will, in terms Anonymous. of, yeah, and, and it, it like long, like lengthening those uh, workouts can can be a little bit taxing. But that would be the first thing that I would advise of like, if we're trying to get the absolute most out of it, going single arm potentially could be the best option. And then we do have video. Uh, Sue is going over a video on on the YouTube channel, mm -hmm. going over some options. Um, and, and you, I don't know. Do you know the title of that? Um, no, but we will have a playlist linked in the show notes going over some common lat movements. We have some really great instructional videos on chest supported lat pull down, which we're going to talk about these exercises. But you'll be able to visually see them if you're more of a visual learner. Chest supported lat pull down, chest supported lat row. Austin and I did a great video, and this goes on to the width of your um, the attachments you're using, um, going over the rope pullover and how wide that might need to be for someone. Um, I also have a video talking about the different attachments. I'm not remembering the name off the top of my head, but talking about how you can utilize your gym's attachment. So if you do not have prime attachments, I, I know sometimes that I've sent videos to clients and they'll say like, Hey, I don't have that bar. And we don't travel with those attachments and we're still able to make things do, um, especially if you have a rope and a D handle, you can make a lot happen at a gym. Um, and I also have a video going over upper back versus lat pull down. And I show, okay, if you don't have these attachments, you can grab these common attachments at your gym, throw them on and still get the desired effect. So do not shortcut yourself and think, oh, I don't have those attachments. I can't do those movements. You a hundred percent can within your gym. You might just have to be a little bit creative and we will have that playlist linked in the show notes so you can visually see it um, and see all the changes we can make and then hear us talk through those movements as well. Yeah. And then also with um, talking about common mistakes and, and stuff that we commonly see and we've messed up in the past as well is thinking that the traditional lat pull down bar is going to be training or biasing the lats. Um, it's not that they are not included. It's not that they're not, there's not tension placed on the lats during that movement. Cause that's just not necessarily true, but they're not biased, right? They're not, that's not where the majority of the tension and load from what you're pulling on is going to. And that's an important, uh, caveat to kind of go into just quickly is it's really important when, when we're doing any movement, there's always a bias towards which muscles are getting the most work, getting the most tension placed on them, right? And so we're wanting to choose exercises and the exercises we're talking about today, and we're gonna talk more about, are exercises that really place a lot more tension on the lats versus the other upper back muscles, like the traps, the rhomboids, the teres, things like that. It's not that those are also not gonna be involved at all, the rear delts, things like that because they are going to have some tension placed on them. We need them to have tension placed on them. That's what allows our, our shoulder joint and, and things to orientate around our rib cage properly. But it's where are we biasing the most tension, even if it's a 60, 40 split, 70, 30, it, it's not that it's a 90, 10 or a hundred zero. It's, it may be small bias over the other, like a 60, 40, but it's a bias and we're placing more tension on that muscle group relative to the other muscle groups. And that's really what we wanna drive home today is that, that point of exercise selection to a degree where we're biasing things rather than isolating things, right? I think that's an important distinction. Yes, I was just about to say, no muscle works in complete isolation. <clears throat> you can't only train your glutes if you're doing a hip thrust. You are going to be using secondary muscle groups. You're going to be using stabilizing muscle groups. They are going to have different load. But whenever we talk about, hey, this is a lat bias, that's what we mean is it's pushing more towards that than anything else. Do we have any other mistakes? I have, I have one in, in the sense of it is a muscle group that you can use a lot of ego with. There's a lot of momentum that can be created. There's a lot of supporting tissue that Sue brought up at the beginning. Um, 
talking about uh, the biceps and, and the forearms and, and the upper back musculature and the rear delts. And there's, there's so much contributing and you can use a little bit of the, the momentum, especially in something like a, a dumbbell or a barbell um, bent over row where that, that can, you can create a lot of momentum from the floor um, and really not target anything that in specifically, it, it's more of just like moving this weight through space. And so one thing that we're going to really drive home as we get into exercises is that there, the intention and something that you'll get from all of our, um, uh, episodes within this series is that intention is the, the biggest thing and having a goal, not just thinking of, okay, this is the number and I want to beat this number each training session. It's that of course we want to see you increase load, but we want the uh, tissue that's being targeted to, to certainly be hit and, and starting there rather than the, the load itself. Yeah. And the last mistake I'll touch on, and this will be a mistake that can go for all of the muscle groups when we do this, is that lack of knowledge of human anatomy can really halt you within this. Not saying that you have to be a complete expert and know absolutely everything. I mean, we could talk specifically exactly where the lat originates and inserts. You don't need to know that. You need to know generally, hey, it's on the back of my upper arm and then it's in my spine on my lower back. And that's generally where it is. And you knowing that allows you to have so much progression, so much ability to continue within that muscle group instead of just being like, oh, this is the exercise that I know. And like Austin said, the lat pull down at the gym with the normal lat bar. I see so many people do that and be like, oh, working my lat so much. And it's like, you're, you're not necessarily biasing them, but because you've told yourself or that the machine has told you that that's the muscle group it's working and you don't know how human anatomy might work, then that's where a lot of things can kind of be, um, either halted or progressed within your training. So if you can get a basic understanding of human anatomy and like very basic, it does not have to be everything that is going to catapult you within your fitness journey so far. And, and I'll plug this cause I know Austin won't do it himself, but <laughs> I would encourage you to get Austin's book to do what Sue is saying, um, where it's going to give you that basic understanding and, and beyond that, of course, but it's going to give you that foundational work for that anatomy, um, understanding and, um, it, it's, it's beautiful. Like if you don't enjoy reading, that's okay because the, it's uh, mainly a picture book. It's an adult picture <laughs> book. <laughs> it, yeah. yeah. It's a very, very nice picture book alongside all the yeah. stuff that Austin put in there. Um, so even just the pictures, if you were not even to, to read the information, you could just like, it is worth just the pictures at that point. Um, it, it's well worth the, what is it, Austin? $20, I think. Uh, 1594 right now. 1594. Oh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> the pictures are, are more valuable at that point than beyond that is all, all the stuff that Austin wrote, but, um, that would be a great place for everyone to start. And I know that, um, well, m- maybe don't by count the time yourself out, Alex, you've made some beautiful muscle drawings. Yeah, seriously. I'm very good. Picasso. Yeah. Make check it. It. Yeah, yeah, check out his Instagram. There's a there's a, um, a clutch and, and, one. And on there. I will be I will be doing a giveaway for Austin's book. I don't know by the time that this is is published, but that will be on my Instagram. So maybe by the time you guys listen to this, you can go uh, enter into that, and we'll be maybe you'll get one for free. But I just encourage you to go buy it. Yeah, that's also it's called Science of Strength Training. If you didn't know, <laughs> yes, um, you didn't just search Austin's <laughs> book. Search and Austin's Google. book, and yeah, on if you type in <laughs> if you type in Austin Current on Amazon, it does come up, so that's helpful. Um, but it is called Science of Strength Training, and it is fifteen dollars. And at the beginning of every so the, in chapter two, there's a it's basically the strength exercises section, and it goes deep into deeper into anatomy. Um, at the start of every muscle group, there's a there's an anatomy overview, and it even talks about uh, muscle function as well. And a lot of what we're talking today uh, about is actually in there, uh, in the the back section, um, talking about the lats, how they function, how the how the back functions in general, and the the main muscle actions it does. And the last thing before we go into exercises here, I, I wanted to just mention if you're overwhelmed a little bit, um, either because of my poor ability to articulate the function of the lat in the beginning, or uh, just in general, it's a lot of information, right? Um, just the, the 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 paralysis by analysis that happens in the early stages of your training career, if you're early on, or someone that's just trying to maybe you know moonwalk your way back to a place where you can reestablish a foundation for yourself. Um, 
to kind of like build a better foundation on moving into the future. Paralysis by analysis is something that, you know, we we've all struggled with. And that basically is just you're you're paralyzed by analyzing every little detail and small thing, right? So our pledge and our way of sharing this information, it's not that you're perfect. And this is how we chat with our clients on a weekly basis. And, and when we're getting them into this stuff and introducing this to them, we're just working to integrate this newfound knowledge into our training, right? This is not, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're not trying to take everything that you've ever learned and throw it out the window. We're trying to integrate that, right? And so just because something isn't perfect doesn't mean you shouldn't do it at all, right? So understand that and understand that when we're sharing about these muscle groups, it's that we want to just introduce you to the ideas and the concepts and the anatomy and kind of generally how it functions, right? Generally how it functions. We're not going into a deep anatomy lesson. If you want to do that, start Googling shit and you're going to come down a rabbit hole, um, buy anatomy books, do that sort of thing. But what we found to be useful is what we're going to be sharing most, right? So try not to get trapped in the paralysis by analysis too much um, and just understand. And again, I'll, I think I have a better grasp of the, the, the intro here. So the attachment point, if we're talking about the function here really quick, stick <laughs> with me, we're talking about the function really quick, it attaches to that upper arm, right? And as it pulls back across the back, across towards the spine, towards the midline of the body, there are parts of the lat that run more horizontally, which come towards the more upper divisions or thoracic, if you're familiar with that term, parts of the back, more of that mid back, mid spine. There's some that then go diagonally down towards the lumbar spine, if you're familiar with that. Typically we all have lumbar injuries. We've all heard of like, yeah, I got, I got a tweak in my L4 or something. That's towards the bottom of the spine, right? So there's some that span across diagonally down to that division or that part of the spine. And then there's some that go more vertically down and attach actually to our pelvis, attach across that connective tissue that rounds across our, our lower back, right? So um, I think that's a little better and more <laughs> explanatory than my original one. So if you stuck with us that lo this long, I appreciate it. Um, but because of that, again, I'll just repeat, those the way those fibers orientate and the way that they span across your back that's why it matters on what angle we're pulling from, whether it's vertical, whether it's horizontal, and how our setup really starts to dictate and where our arm path is, is coming across our back really matters, right? And so um, I think that was a little better than my original one. So we can move on to exercises now. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, like he was saying, there's going to be vertical and horizontal exercises that we're going to go over. So Alex, give us your fave exercises. Um, I'll, I'll start with, with vertical. So there's going to be kind of three renditions to, to this movement specifically. Um, and it's going to be kind of dependent on what's available to you. Um, I prefer personally the, uh, chest supported pull down in which I just, posted about yesterday, um, which who knows, you know, what day that is for you when you hear this, but, um, the chest supported posted pulled out. about it on May 24th. Yeah. For you to find. Um, so within that, I, I think that the chest supported pull down, it allows for, um, the, the best environment to, uh, really get after it and, and have a lot of load on a, um, muscle group. That's very hard. The, so in that vertical plane, we're training those iliac fibers that Austin just spoke on and some of that lumbar fascia, those, those are going to be the, or I'm sorry, the, the lumbar tissue. Um, those are going to be the two main divisions uh, of the lat that we're going to be targeting in that line of pull. Um, and those two um, portions of the lat are very hard to train. There's not many exercises that we can align with that are going to to really focus and, and bias the greater tension towards those those two divisions, if you will. Um, so with that uh, in mind, the chest ported pull down is, is one of my personal favorites. Then uh, another option of this would be a single arm pull down. I find that the um, stability uh, of the, the um, chest supported pull down with, with uh, utilizing both hands is just more stable and I'm able to get after it a little bit more. I like the single arm. Um, and then another option would be the, uh, if you don't have like the ability to move a bench over to a cable, then you can still perform a neutral grip pull down. It is going to be a little bit more 
technique savvy and, and, and require you to um, contract your abdomen to an upteenth degree. That's another aspect of these vertical pulling motions is that when we look at, at targeting tissue, the opposing tissue that's working to stabilize is going to be the abdomen for the division of the lat that we are, are targeting here. So we want to have, like, it doesn't need to be a fully like crunched down. I, I'm at like maximal contraction of the abdomen, but it does need to have some, um, some tension there. We don't want to be in thoracic extension and, and lengthening the abdomen, um, and kind of rounding out at the the spine, if you will, we want to have that tension there to create a better stable environment for that tissue to work. Because it, if we're training, um, it, it's very similar in the sense of if we're training biceps, we're going to have some tension to stabilize with the tricep and some of that supporting tissue. So for the lats, the abdomen is going to be that. Um, and when we're doing that vertical pull down, just in a, a general pull down, um, seat at, that you would have at your gym, where we're still using that neutral grip hand placement that we spoke on, you have to lean back, um, and kind of scoop back almost your, your butt hanging off that seat uh, is a, a better positioning, um, until someone makes a, a better lap pull down as a whole. <laughs> um, and that time will come, I'm sure. Um, but it, it, that like doing it in the, just the pull down is, is one of the more challenging and, and least stable positions in my opinion, because you have to be so pulled off the seat so that your elbows and arm angle align with what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. When, uh, the ab thing, imagine really quick, what would you do if someone said, Hey, I'm about to punch you in the stomach. That's what you're searching for there. Like yeah. you tense up, you'd sort of compress the abs. But if someone said they're about to punch you in the stomach, you wouldn't like crunch your abs, like a, you know, right. a sit up, right. I you would just kind of like the tense the first them. punch. And then the <laughs> second punch really got me. That's right. <laughs> um, but what I want to touch on in case you are listening to this and wondering more specifically, okay, well, why would I use a chest support? As you just said, it's a much more stable environment and doing it without the chest support is a little bit more difficult. But I know I get this question a lot within my clients of, hey, if you say I can do it with or without the chest support, because I'll put that in the notes if they can't do it at their gym. The chest support allows for more stability and more output because you are having that opposing force and you are having a better lineup with the tissue and you can really just like get after it within that. If you're not worried, you're still going to be, I mean, contracting your abdomen. It's not like you just get to like do whatever as you go through it. Um, but it is something where it gives you that stability. It gives you that opposing force and it allows you to have more output. So if you've ever done either exercise and you're like, I can do way more weight when it's chest supported versus not, that's going to be the reason why. Also think about a, um, if, if you're thinking about opposing force, if you're kind of curious about what that is, um, <clears throat> what the opposing force, I think about a, um, a preacher curl for biceps, that pad is the opposing force, right? The pad you're driving your upper arm into to drive the bicep, right? To drive that load up. Obviously we're talking about lats in general, but talking about opposing force, a preacher curl is a great example of what opposing force is. Right. And so that bench becomes kind of that preacher bench essentially for you. Um, like you were doing a, an arm curl or something, but, uh, still within that, I, I definitely want to pull out abs are still important, right? So the lats are pulling the lats pull on your pelvis, especially vertically. So those vertical fibers attach to your pelvis and, uh, Alex stated the iliac fibers, right? which attach to that pelvis. That's, that's what that pelvis is. That's what that bone is, right? So that is going to pull on the pelvis and that pulls upward. Think about it, like sort of giving you a wedgie, right? It's <laughs> pulling upward, right? So we need an opposing force on the other side to stabilize that. And what is that? The abs, right? So the abs do that on the other side. And that's why it's important to keep those uh, engaged and just think about abs engaged, right? Not crunching, just kind of tense, absorb the blow, like, <laughs> like a true Michael Scott. Um, <laughs> just watch out for the second one, essentially. Yes. And um, just to hammer that in one last time, when it comes to these movements, 
um, you want to line up the tissue with the resistance. So as we talked about, a common mistake is how you set yourself up. The reason why you might have a little bit different positioning if you're doing it with a chest support versus not is at the end of the day, and this is why it's important to have a basic level of human anatomy, you're lining up that tissue with the resistance. So that's why you have to scoot back a little bit because it's so vertical. If you're using the normal cable lat pull down, you have to scoot back, lean back and be able to line up that tissue with the resistance. Um, but we'll go into some horizontal movements that are our favorites here, Austin, if you want to take that. Yeah, sure. So more horizontal related movements are going to be like a seated cable row, <clears throat> excuse me, a seated cable row. Now, similar to the vertical one, there are chest supported options that we, again, are on our YouTube channel. They'll be linked in that uh, playlist on YouTube uh, in the show notes, or you can just search physique development on YouTube. Our channel will come up. You can search for that playlist on the homepage. Um, but the seated row variations, again, training more of that horizontal uh, component and those horizontal fibers, the ones that are more parallel to the floor, if that makes sense, and span across the upper parts of your back or that mid back, not upper, but more mid back, um, and make up more of the upper divisions of the lat itself and more of the upper and mid divisions of the lat. Okay. And so seated row options are great, still a neutral grip. Okay. So when we're training lats, we really like a neutral grip. Now there are some other variations. You can kind of change up the grip a little bit, but if we're looking to get the most bang for our buck here, we like neutral grip a lot, right? You may not get the last 2% of each side of that range, but to be honest, that's fine. Cause I'm sure you're going to get it somewhere else. Um, so again, the most bang for your buck is going to come from that neutral grip position. So similar to vertical, um, I think we've all done a seated row at some point, right? Whether it be machine or cable, um, variation, or maybe like a bent o bent over dumbbell row, which I think is probably the least effective. So I would say a seated cable or a machine row that is chest supported is probably your best option for training the lats, uh, more horizontally. Um, from there, again, same with vertical, it's very important that the abs are engaged. It's very important that our feet are stable and locked on, you know, locked onto our foot position on the ground or a platform. Again, on YouTube, you'll see a lot of our videos where we are some, sometimes manipulating cable machines. Sometimes we're manipulating the foot platforms a little bit to give us a better structure. Um, Sometimes we're wheeling a bench over to a cable system to give ourselves a chest support and use that opposing force that we talked about within the vertical variations. So <clears throat> that's kind of the, those are the big ones that I can think of as far as, far as like horizontal movements is just that cable, uh, the seated cable row again, more visual and you want to watch a video. All these are on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> but it is important that we are again, using a neutral grip and we are having those abs engaged and, and compressed rather um, during the movements. So did you have any more details there? Yeah, I just wanted to say for horizontal, whether you're doing a cable or machine, again, the setup is very important. There are going to be a lot of row machines that might be labeled one way, just like the lat pull down that are not inherently hitting that, or you might have to alter it to make sure you're hitting it. So for something horizontal, first, you can have a little bit of a forward lean to make sure that you're getting your lats fully engaged. Um, so that's uh, going to be making sure that it's no hunching or anything, but just that forward lean while keeping everything neutral. Um, but it's also something where as you're pulling, you're going to be thinking about or as you're rowing, I should say that that hand is coming more towards your hip. Now, not necessarily that it's going to go straight to your hip and be in your pocket. But as you're rowing, a machine or a cable might pull you more um, towards like your chest or your belly button. And you want to think about more so down towards your hip just as a um, initiation more so. Um, but since you mentioned the dumbbell bent over row, um, and then another one I know is going to be probably a common ask is going to be like a pull up. Do those truly tra train your lats? I mean, they, they do, but <laughs> That's what I'm... Not, like in the, not in the bias sense that we're, we're speaking on. I think that like the pull-ups and then also like the, the barbell bent over row, the dumbbell bent over row, these, um, 
uh, foundational movements that you have probably been taught since the very beginning are, are fantastic movements as, as a whole. But when we're thinking of, of targeting specific tissue, these three specifically are not going to be the best for us you know, talking about lats at the, at the very moment. Um, so yeah, still, still valuable movements. I think that that's the, the big thing. And, and one thing with the horizontal pulls is that N1 Education is doing some pretty cool research right now that I think is going to change our mind in terms of the, the line of pull that we work in. And, and uh, well, not as well, we can still use the one that we're speaking on here, but more so adding more diversity to those angles that in which we can pull from. And, and it still is going to be dependent on the arm path and things of that nature, but they're doing some pretty cool stuff right now that I think is going to um, benefit us greatly. Um, and that thoracic division of the lat that we're trying to chain train in the horizontal plane is oftentimes the portion of the lat that many people um, have almost by accident just from you know, gripping and ripping for many different exercises. So this is probably the, if we were to say any portion of the lat that you have, um, you know, contracted those fibers well on almost accident or in your mind purposefully, but really on accident, mm -hmm. um, this is the division that you probably have felt before, um, as this is going to be kind of the easiest of the three that we've spoken on so far that are going to be able to be targeted, um, directly. Yeah. Well, the last exercise I was going to say that we didn't mention because we talked about lat pull down and lat row and some variations of those is going to be the rope pullover, which we uh, um, very quickly mentioned earlier. But that definitely is a favorite to be able to hit the lats as well. Um, and a note um, kind of going from these exercises and common mistakes is that if your posture is bad throughout the day, you might have a lot of issues with being able to get that mind muscle connection and contract certain musculatures. So if you are still struggling after you've watched videos and you feel like your execution is in the correct spot, it could be something with your posture from that wear and tear and being in those positions all day. Yeah. And I just wanted to kind of like go down a, a quick list, kind of a quick hitter list to audit your technique and execution okay so just a quick hitter list uh first one body position and setup will make or break everything okay it's like out training a bad diet you're going to be in consistent battle or constant battle with yourself trying to find tension trying to place tension on the right muscles so take time to not only learn but watch their watch some of our videos uh in one education is also a great resource go watch any of those videos and really learn, take time to learn how to set yourself up because if you set yourself up correctly, it really should be pretty intuitive from there. Okay. Number two, choose the best accessory for the job. Again, a lot of these lap based movements are more neutral grip, uh, in, in nature. Again, your body structure does matter. You know, if you're Shaquille O'Neal, you're going to need a different attachment than if you're myself or the Sue other Bush. two individuals here, Sue Bush, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, Just so again, a little bit different structures. Yeah, and <laughs> so the widest that, you know that obnoxiously wide attachment in all gyms that were like, yeah, lats, probably not the best one either, right? So it's probably more of that middle of the road attachment that we can, we kind of just choose for our grip and rip ex exercises. That's probably a pretty good one. Number three, <clears throat> um, keep core engaged, do not arch the, arch the back. Uh, so again, core engagement is a big thing. If you're thinking about how much, think about if someone was about to punch you in the stomach, how would you sort of brace for that? That's a pretty good beginning way to think about that, starting way to think about that. Um, if you're in a vertical pull down, if you're working in the vertical plane, think about driving the elbows down. If you're thinking about a horizontal row, think about driving the elbows back as you drive them down. Okay. And also, allowing that to integrate with elbow flexion, shoulder extension, things that we'd normally do in a row, right? Again, it's not this, as Alex mentioned, it's not this robotic disconnect of a movement. We still want to have a continuous, normal tempo and motion within our movement, but we want things to initiate properly. And then it becomes really easy from there, especially if we're set up correctly, right? Um, did we want to mention really quick anything that was more applicable to uh, competitors and, and stuff like that? Um, I, I would say in terms of just uh, competitors in general is that um, I think that with us working with bikini competitors, it is a uh, 
very important piece to allow for your your waist to appear smaller. The the better width that we can give to your shoulders, the better width that we can give to your upper back is going to be advantageous to your overall presentation. Um, and, and another component of this is that um, as much as you want to just focus on your delts and growing your delts and delts, 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 like we have to have the tissue surrounding it, these larger muscle groups that are, are going to be supporting tissue in these delt movements that you're performing. This tissue needs to be trained too. In, in, um, like we have to have density and strength in those tissue to, in those, uh, particular muscle groups to allow for the delts to grow. So having chest training, having, um, the ability to stabilize with, uh, the pec, all those different factors are very important. So when you are structuring your training program, whether, you know, whatever division it is, it still needs to be all encompassing. Uh, there, there are going to be athletes who need more volume in specific places than others, but all in all, it needs to be a complete program, um, that's tailored to the individual. It doesn't need to just be glutes and, and delts. And then you just keep rotating between, you know, I'm doing glutes this day and then delts this day. And then I just keep going back and forth. Like, mm -hmm. and, and that's a lot, like, I'm sure that there are a lot of individuals that, um, are listening that they, you know, may look up to another competitor that that's literally their training, but understand that that person maybe have, maybe has been competing for eight to 10 years. And at this point in their competing career, they need to just really fine tune some small details. You as a, as a, the, the person listening, maybe you're in your first year competing, maybe you're in your second year competing. You don't have the foundational muscle tissue or the foundational training experience to even be in that specific, you know, very low volume training. And I will tell you that it is not a fun way of training. That is <laughs> probably the most boring way of going about things to only have an exercise selection and exercise variants of about five to six exercises spread across really, we can say two muscle groups in, in the broader spectrum, we can you know, break it down into smaller components. But in reality, two main muscle groups that you're you know bouncing between is going to be very boring and you're going to get burnt out pretty quick. Yeah. So even if it's not something that, especially in bikini, you're told your back needs to be a certain way, obviously within the criteria, within the division, they talk a lot about the structure of your shoulders and your glutes and your hamstrings, but it is something not only for the health of your body long-term. So if you don't train your back um, or you don't train your chest, you can have some really messed up issues as you age, um, but it's also something that puts together for the whole physique. Um, I know no, I've talked about it on my Instagram before that training chest changed my physique in a positive manner for bikini, which you don't hear a lot. You hear training shoulders and training glutes, but I needed that chest density to be able to present a better physique, a less bird like physique. Um, I didn't want to be looking like I just had this concave chest without any structure to it. And growing my back has really helped, like Alex said, within my waist um, and being able to show that off. And with lats, what I wanted to touch on specifically, as I know within the bikini division, that they're talking a lot about not flaring your lats. And with that, you might think, oh, I don't need to train my lats or lats are an important piece. Within them speaking on that for not to flare your lats, I think it's very person dependent. It's very competitor dependent. And like Alex was talking about when it comes to your density, if you have intense density of doing this sport for years, you probably don't need to flare your lats because it's just hanging there. But if you are a more amateur or novice competitor, you might have to change the way that you pose or the way that you train because it's where you're at in your journey. So realize that each time that these either rule changes or division updates come out or these things come out, not to take them as gospel and that you should never do them. And if you do them, you're the worst competitor ever. But really, looking at it situationally for you, does this matter to how my physique looks, what needs to be changed and how is my whole physique need to be able to be improved? So um, I think it's something that we'll touch on when we talk about each muscle group about how it can not only help for your overall physique, but also for a certain division or within competing in general as to why there is a reason for having that in your training. Form and function. Aesthetics matter right. for competing. Function matters for, for longevity of life, right? So to compete well, we need to live well. Because if we're not alive, we ain't competing, right? <laughs> if we don't feel well, 
we're not competing. If we're not training well, we're not competing, right? So all jokes aside, it's very important. You know, we need aesthetics for competition, but we also need form and function and we need things to work properly. And all divisions of the lat, again, have their own jobs and help stabilizing different parts um, of different movements, but also the pelvis and, and helping, you know, stabilize things across the board. So um, if you guys have any feedback, again, this is our first muscle group episode. So if you've gotten this far, thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you guys have any feedback for us, any further questions, anything more specific we didn't necessarily touch on or you had questions on, there is a form in the show notes where you can ask your question. You can include that and we will absolutely take note of that and, and get those answered as we can throughout the podcast episodes. Yeah, we might do a wrap up episode of anything that's been from the series to make sure that we're answering each question for each muscle group that you want covered that wasn't covered in the full episode. There you go. It's a great idea. So, um, <laughs> so from there, again, there is also a playlist in the show notes uh, on our YouTube channel that will highlight back movements, but specific to the lats and then in our next muscle group episode, we'll be going over upper back. So get excited about that. Um, that's a, that's a fun one. Yeah. There's a lot there. It's a fun one. There's a lot of variation to the upper back and there's, there's a lot of stuff we're still learning about the upper back, but there's a lot of stuff that we sort of have built our foundations on that has been proved very useful for clients, whether lifestyle or competition. So anything else to add there, guys? Train your lats, get huge. <laughs> I have nothing. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, guys, for listening, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.